So uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm Faye Perrell here in Cognitive Science, and I'm going to be introducing our, our lecturer today. Before I get started on that, I want to remind you all that there's a reception upstairs um, in 111. Delicious piles of food for all of you. <laughs> so please join us after the lecture for that reception. All right. Well, I'm very pleased to welcome Eve Sweetser, the Department of Cognitive Sciences, Academic Careers in Engineering and Science Distinguished Lecturer. Um, Eve is a professor in the Department of Linguistics at UC Berkeley. Um, she teaches in the Celtic Studies program, and she directed the Cognitive Science program at UC Berkeley for many years. She graduated from Harvard with degrees in Linguistics and Classics, and did her graduate work at Berkeley as well. Um, Eve is also a member of one of the earliest generations of cognitive linguists. So researchers who really objected to this very long tradition of studying language uh, without any interest in general cognition. So Eve is uh, a great pioneer and has really had uh, an enormous impact on how researchers all over the world see language. She's had an illustrious career um, publishing extensively on an intimidating range of topics in the top journals in a bunch of different fields, including cognitive linguistics and cognitive science. So she's truly a distinguished lecturer uh, by virtue of her success as a researcher and a scholar. But of course, anybody can become a widely respected researcher. You know, that's nothing. <laughs> I want to highlight another aspect of Eve's career, um, one that made her an ideal candidate for this, ACES, uh, this ACES lecture. Uh, Professor Sweetser is notorious for being an extraordinary mentor. She has the magical ability to change people's lives simply by being supportive, uh, enthusiastic, even about very poorly formed ideas, uh, and endlessly generous with her time. So she's had a major impact on the lives of dozens of undergraduates, uh, hundreds of graduate students. And it's the kind of impact that you know, we as faculty all hope to have on students' lives. And I can speak from personal experience. I met Eve when I was an undergraduate. And working with her really changed my life. But I know it's easy to say somebody changed my life. You know, So-and-so really shaped the, the course of my destiny. So I want to show you guys what this actually looked like. OK. OK, so here is my life before I met Eve Sweetser. OK. And here is my life, you know, during the period when Eve and I became acquainted. So you see, things are looking up for me. And here is my glorious life. <laughs> Because of Eve Sweetser. So here's my future, <laughs> thanks to Eve Sweetser. <laughs> OK. So all hyperbole aside, uh, it really is a great personal pleasure for me to invite you all to welcome uh, Professor Eve Sweetser. Well, now I can go hide under the table uh, from, from uh, embarrassment. <laughs> but it is true, Faye, that there's some people where all you have to do is like the, the way you change their life is like point out a copy of um, Hand and Mind or something like that. It doesn't take too much to change lives that are like all ready for that particular. <laughs> anyway, OK. Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to gradually work on um, and that I didn't know that I was, that I had a coherent interest in viewpoint and perspective um, until these things kind of came together. I got into the, uh, the study of gesture because I was interested in metaphor and metaphoric cognition and gestural evidence for metaphor. And then uh, working with sign researchers, I got really interested in um, 
iconicity and what the nature of linguistic and non-linguistic iconicity was, and oh, gestures are really great place to investigate that. Um, but I have for a long time been interested in uh, viewpoint and perspective in mental space structures, and well, you sort of can't avoid um, viewpoint in um, sign language and gesture. So uh, the ideal would be, if we, for me anyway, my sort of like what I'd like to, uh, to be able to do would be to tell you a story that started with what it is to be a human being with physical viewpoint and end up with um, the obvious reasons why the range of possibilities for literary viewpoint are what they are, okay? Really higher order cognition from the lower order stuff. And I can't do that. I won't be able to do that for you today. But um, here are some of the pieces of the puzzle that I think I have put together anyway. Okay, so um, this is a Wallace Stevens poem. Um, and it says, I placed a jar in Tennessee and round it was upon a hill. It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. It took dominion everywhere. Okay, um, what I'd like to say is by being in a space, a human brings viewpoint to the space. A human brings a deictic structure, a perspective, a physical viewpoint to a space by being there. By being, if I'm alone in a room and someone comes in, my understanding of the space in the room is different from the way it was before, right? So that's the crucial, and ev this is true of every other kind of human space as well. So um, Rafael Nunez, my colleague uh, who, uh, with whom I have worked on his, um, some of his Aymara data, and you'll see some of that later on, he works up in the Andes, and in these towns they believe that their houses should face the sunrise, and they're on the west side of the Andes, so their houses face up the mountain. and. Um, in every little town, there is a single house, a single building that faces down the mountain, faces outward. So here you are climbing up a trail in the Andes. I've seen all of Raphael's photos. I have not climbed these trails myself. Um, and there's not a single window or a single door in the town visible as you approach the town. It's blank sides of buildings. And one building has an open door and a window that you can see as you come up the trail. Which one? The school. The government built that. The Spanish speakers from down at the coast came up and thought the right way for a house to face was downhill with a view, right? Well, what's going on there? Why are, why are houses viewpointed, right, um, as extensions of humans? So let's, uh, with that note, let's uh, go on here. So what's interesting about um, viewpoint and perspective? Well, um, one thing that's interesting for I think a lot of people, and I listed linguists, cognitive scientists, and blending theorists, but I think more as well, um, is that humans just do live in and manipulate viewpoint structures. So all languages reflect that fact. So I'm going to um, go through some linguistic constructions that reflect viewpoint and talk about those a bit too. But if we're talking about, um, as uh, blending theorists in cognitive science might say, living the blend, um, this is one of the most fully inhabited blends we've got. We'd we live as viewpointed people, and I will give you a blending analysis of viewpoint, a partial one anyway. Okay, but the other crucial thing is that I think is too infrequently thought about, but I think narrative theorists have come to the conclusion that it needs to be thought about seriously, is that we all don't just have one viewpoint on any situation we're part of, we have access to multiple viewpoints. Okay, so by the fact that you guys are in the room, right, my viewpoint on the room is different than it would otherwise be. Um, that's why I'm facing the way I'm facing. That's why I'm acting and gesturing the way I'm acting and gesturing and so on. Um, and I'm trying to make myself visible and audible to you guys, right? So it isn't just all about me and my viewpoint, let's hope. Um, we also have access to more or less different, more view, viewpointed or less viewpointed construals. So this is, um, well, I br bring this in at the end, but Faye and I were just talking about her research recently, um, and she's been working on what a lot of people have noticed, that there is the, this possibility of so-called participant versus global um, viewpoints on situations, and um, gesture shows it, sign language shows it, uh, whatever. So things like, um, here I have an ASL car, the car can go down a road, um, this is just a car out here. I'm not in the picture, okay? I'm not here. But if instead I have 
<laughs> right? I have this, I'm a, the scared driver in the car. That's participant viewpoint. OK, so we have the capacity to have more or less viewpointed construals on things. And all of us have um, cognitively the ability to sort of uh, gradually create maps of um, spaces that don't depend specifically on viewpoint. So all of you have in your head maps of the Case campus that don't depend specifically on where you are. Um, and I have a map of Berkeley in my head. All right. Um, there's a, a large amount of cross-linguistic variation in how viewpoint patterns are linguistically categorized, but there are real patterns as well, so we should come to that. And I don't think that there's any surprise that there should be patterns, because not just human perceptual apparatus, but human neural architecture um, puts important constraints on how we can access perspectival construals of our, of our own and of other people. Um, and I will get to primary scenes later on. <laughs> Um, but to, just to finish the introduction, we can't have our own single viewpoint of space or of cognitive structure when other people are present. So I, I'm really coming more and more to the conclusion that viewpoint at any given time is a complex of multiple viewpoints that the um, speaker is constructing, is building up, rather than just, okay, this is what I think the world is like, right? It's, wait a minute, this is what I think this bunch of different shared viewpoints or less shared viewpoints, this complex of viewpoints is about. All right. Um, so here's some of the things that um, viewpoint has been said to be about. So um, where the speaker and addressee are, so when they say something like, when you say, you say something linguistic like here, what do you mean by here, um, there, this, that, uh, this chair, that chair, um, next door, next door to where I am, presumably, right? Um, when the speaker and hearer are presumed to be, so things like now, then, tomorrow, last year. Um, Chuck Fillmore, my old advisor at Berkeley, used to always say that um, you could imagine um, getting, when people told him that a neutral context meant you didn't know anything about the um, broader context of a message, and one of his, um, one of his own advisors, who was an advocate of dividing context and pragmatics from linguistic structure, had suggested that you should consider these um, example sentences as if you had received them in a bottle you know, from an unknown um, sender. And he was saying, like, what would I do if I received a message in a bottle that said, um, meet me here tomorrow? Right? You wouldn't know. The normal thing is for language to be contextualized um, so that the viewpoint can be understood. OK. Um, what an imagined, what, what, where and when an imagined percipient is and um, how they can um, see and reach and so on things from imagined locations and imagined spaces. Um, but also, what the speaker and addressee might be assumed to know, think, presuppose, mentally calculate, and so on about whatever mental space is involved. So when I choose to say the or a, I'm making a statement about whether I think you, my addressees, will be able to identify the referent that I'm talking about. If I chose a, I would be making um, the opposite choice. Um, if, when I say if, I'm making an assumption that you, OK, now I'm assuming that I don't want to make a commitment about whether this is going to happen or not. But if I say when, well, yeah, I do think it's going to happen, right? I don't know for sure when it's going to happen, but I, I do know. I do think it's going to happen. Um, choices of formal and informal pronouns in languages that allow them, or address terms in English, for example, where the pronouns don't show these things. So are you going to address me as um, Eve Sweetser, uh, Dr. Sweetser, Professor Sweetser, Ms. Sweetser? Um, which of these things? Obviously, you're saying something about your interaction with me by making one of those um, choices. Um, and my, and my favorite um, presuppositional verb, which I'm uh, currently trying to um, decipher, is no. And the interesting thing about no is that it's describing somebody's mental space. So I say, um, oh yeah, Sue knows that Mark is coming. I'm supposed to be talking about Sue and Sue's knowledge state, Sue's cognitive states. But actually, I told you something about mine as well. Right? Because if I, if I had said Sue thinks Mark is coming, I would be completely neutral as to whether I believe that Mark is coming. But if I say Sue knows Mark is coming, I not only say that Sue believes it, but that 
yeah, I believe that too. I think that's the truth. Um, so viewpoint of more than one person included in one verb. Okay, um, what the speaker and address see feel about the um, contents of the relevant spaces, so how they evaluate them. So are you going to call certain behavior, fa famous examples, um, thrifty or stingy? Could be the same behavior, but it tells you something about the, how the person evaluates um, that kind of behavior. Um, hopefully, maybe. And what imagined participants might think, suppose, calculate, feel, et cetera, about these things, and lots more. Um, so sh we'll, talk, we'll see that. Um, Dykes' and viewpoint have to do with social identification and differentiation, um, all kinds of fun things. So in short, almost anything about a particular individual's portrayal of mental spaces that is particular to that individual, that tells you something about what that individual and their interlocutor's mental states are. And a lot of what we say tells us something about oh yeah, this is how I feel about it, this is my perspective on it, and this is what I think your perspective is and how I'm trying to negotiate um, with it. So um, viewpoint is a far, and perspective are far more widely um, spread phenomena in language than most people seem to think. Um, okay, so the term subjectivity has been used, that people that, that who, who that term is associated with in linguistics are um, Ron Langeker and Elizabeth Traugott are the two people that are the giants of uh, bringing this, uh, 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 of uh, developing our understanding of this. And what I'm, I'm going to give you a sort of more Langekarian um, view of it here. But um, so what subjectivity is, is implicitly having the conceptualizer present in the construal. So something like here. Wait a minute, I gotta like now figure out, I didn't mention me, but I have to know where me is to know where here is. Okay, um, and Dykes' is specifically the implicit presence of the speech exchange scenario and context of the uh, conceptualizer. So I just gave you an example with here. Okay, um, so Langecker stresses this, this idea that um, it is specifically the offstage and implicit um, presence of this viewer and the viewing scene that makes something particularly viewpointed. So if I were to write a sentence that said, um, Eve Sweetser is in room, um, what number is this, nine? Um, Crawford, right, at uh, four, whatever it is, uh, <laughs> on March 26th, that wouldn't, even though it might be about me, you wouldn't have to do a lot of specific processing about my viewpoint to understand that sentence. But if, if I, if I um, phoned somebody from, uh, and said, I'm here now, right, without knowing what the context is, um, they don't have a, have a prayer. Okay, um, so Traugott didn't, didn't so much stress the implicitness of the um, speaker here interaction in the involvement in subjectivity, but I think she really did um, mean that. Um, she, she, uh, the same data is being talked about here. Um, examples of something getting more subjective um, that are classically given are root modal um, taking on an epistemic meaning. Um, so he should be home by now might mean somebody has put an injunction on him that he ought to be home, right? He's got a duty of some kind, but it could also mean Yes, um, in my epistemic processes, I assess the, that it's probable that he's home by now, okay? Uh, which you really need to attribute that to me and to my epistemic processes, whereas the um, somebody told him to be home by now could be somebody else. It doesn't have to be me that's imposing the um, deontic modality. Um, similarly, aspect and tense. So, Aspect, if we, when we can separate it from tense, the problem is English sort of demands that you express both at once. But um, knowing that something is perfective or imperfective doesn't tell you when it is with respect to me. It tells you something about how continuative or non-continuative, um, also about what a viewpoint you're taking on it, uh, maybe a global versus a participant viewpoint, for example, too. Um, but tense is just plain old dictic, right? 
if I say was, then it has to be past relative to some now or other. So um, tense is um, but classically thought of as more viewpointed. I, I might dispute that. There's some viewpoint and aspect too. OK, but n none of these analyses have dealt with the complexity of relationships within the ground. The idea that the speaker and the hearer are sharing a ground, negotiating a ground, um, have a complex um, viewpoint structure. Um, now I'm going to give the, the next thing I'm going to give you is a sort of blending analysis of viewpoint. And in order to do that, I'm going to um, wa want to be able to um, separate out the idea of a viewer's perspective from the presence of a full deictic center of an idea that I am there, not just some, some viewer or other. Okay? So to think about this, think about a um, very common convention in art, which is called deferred viewing. So in your painting, you put a person who's looking at a view. Okay, and that person can probably see different things than you can see, but you're brought into the painting and involved in the view by um, indirect participation here. So it doesn't have to be exactly your view. Um, so think about that as the kind of contrast I'm talking about here. So come and go, and here and there, I'd like to say, involve, um, maybe not there, involve uh, full deictic centers and arrive or across from don't. So if I say Sue jumped across the table, it could be that she jumped across the table from me, but it might just be from wherever she was, and you don't know where I am with respect to it at all. Um, Sue sat across the table from somebody whose viewpoint we're taking, but not necessarily me or you, right? Um, Sue has arrived in LA, and I can say um, Sue has arrived there as well as Sue has arrived here. But notice I couldn't say Sue has come there as easily. That makes, that, it gets a little tough. Um, come really is strongly deictic, and it's strongly deictic for a proximal deixis, not for a distal deixis. Okay. Now, English has this interesting, it might, might start anybody thinking about the relationship between um, speakers and addressees' viewpoints, because English has a requirement that we, for certain, in certain instances, displace our expressed viewpoint and take the, the addressee's viewpoint rather than our own. So things like, um, can you come to my party? Fine. Right? Um, now, this is already getting to be complex because I could say that to you here. And so we wouldn't have to be at the location that you're going to come to. But that location is associated with me. And come has proximal dixis and is associated with the speaker. OK, fine. Uh, that's already complex enough. But now, sure, I'll come to your party. And I wouldn't say, sure, I'll go to your party. Sure, I'll go to Sue's party. Right, somebody else's party. But the correct way to say this, the polite way to say this in English is, sure, I'll come to your party, where I'm kind of required to take the viewpoint of the other person. So someone calls you up, and you say, oh, I'll come right over. You don't say, I'll go right over, even though you then turn around and say to the person who uh, got woken up by the phone call, as well as you, you say, I'm going over to Sue's. Right? Okay. But to Sue, you said, I'm coming right over. So you had to take Sue's viewpoint. Um, notice that I and you, the pronouns, are really hard to displace in this kind of way. You wouldn't change those. But the come and go centers move easily between I as come, or, as come center and you as come center and are even required to some of the time in English. OK. Um, so this is um, what, I, what I call a vanilla um, deictic system semantics. This is what a lot of people have said about deictic systems. So analyses, common analyses say things like, this is near the speaker, that is near the addressee, and not near the speaker. Um, and maybe if in a three-part system, um, there's a yawn term, which English doesn't really have nowadays, which is like far from both the speaker and the addressee. Um, now it turns out that um, Steve Levinson, for example, who's done a lot of investigation of cross-linguistic uh, deictic systems and has found a lot of regularities in them. Uh, but among the things that he hasn't spent as much time on, um, and increasingly less time as we move down the list, <laughs> are, is the referent visible to the speaker or the addressee? 
right? Not just um, near, but is it visible? Is it manually accessible to these people? So um, this tends to mean visible and manually accessible, and that um, not visible or not manually accessible. And even does the referent count as being um, possessed by or somehow in the custody of um, one of these people. So Bill Hanks has these lovely examples with um, the Mayan speakers that he works with where um, someone will be um, standing next to a cooking fire and say, um, you know, that there cooking fire, um, because it's her sister-in-law's cooking fire that she would never in a gazillion years dream of intruding by cooking on. And um, this here cooking fire on the other side of the yard, which is my own cooking fire that I cook on all the time. Um, so the connection with the person of possession or so on can really influence whether we understand these things. And furthermore, is the location of the referent conventionally or habitually associated with one of these people? So here we have the example of, can you come to my party? Um, I may not be at home when I invite you. Or maybe even, for example, if it's a wedding, the party might not be being held at my home. right? But I'm, I'm the person who'll be giving the party. Okay. Um, so we were already seeing that just near speaker and near addressee um, and not near either is way too simple for even deictic systems, forget about the rest of uh, viewpoint. And we also have to add into the mix um, what um, I might call the scale of construal. So uh, when I say here, what do I mean? I could mean um, this very room right here. I could mean this place on the floor. And uh, when we get to spatiotemporal stuff, people all the time um, point directly down like this and say, right now. OK, so there's, a, there's added temporal metaphors here as well. But I could mean this spot right here in front of my feet. I could mean this room. I could mean case, Cleveland, Earth, whatever. Um, and this is the kind of vagueness that's shared by lots and lots of locational terms, um, like home, for example. OK. Um, Besides Bill Hanks, um, Johanna Ruba's work has particularly investigated the uh, interesting uses of this and that and here and there. So what she did, what she thought she was doing, was conducting interviews with um, citizens of the town of San Diego about the um, English-only movement in California to find out people's attitudes. Now, as it happened, the interviews were all conducted in the same room on the San Diego campus, the office that she occupied at that time as a graduate student. So they were all in exactly the same place. And she started to notice very strange uses of this and that and here and there, which seemed to have to do with whether it was my kind of neighborhood culturally as opposed to um, the kind of neighborhood where I don't belong. That neighborhood and there were the kinds of places I wouldn't go. Whoever, whichever ethnicity I am in the relevant interview. And um, this and here are the kinds of places that I would go. Um, she also noticed, even a, a further afield, a she noticed that um, many of the English speaking, the native English speaking um, folks interviewed, used you to refer to immigrants that they felt they could identify with. So you come here, you work hard. Um, <laughs> Right? Um, and they to refer to the kind of immigrants that they didn't think were the right kind to have. Uh, so second person is already more involved in the viewpoint that I'm expressing, right? And third person is outside the kind of viewpoint that I'm expressing. So part of what they're saying is um, somebody that I'm saying yeah to is somebody I have to share some viewpoint with, that I have to negotiate viewpoint structure with. And somebody who's over there, they, I don't need to necessarily share any viewpoint with. OK. Um, lots and lots of social viewpoint markers as well. Um, so there's this delightful exchange. Um, Japanese honorifics are often analyzed as expressing the speaker's imagined relationship to the addressee. Um, there's other ones that are to the, to the um, person being described as well. So there's two separate sets. Um, and below, we have a descriptive honorific use, which um, Richard Dasher actually heard. Um, and you, you can, if you go and look at Richard Dasher's uh, book on this subject and find it if you want. But the, corps, the same corporate secretary um, was saying to the president's wife, inquiring about his health, he was home with the flu, right? Um, how is the honored president's um, 
health today, and one minute later to somebody who she was canceling an appointment with, our humble, not honorable um, president can't keep his appointment because he's ill. Okay, um, because in one case, she was the outsider inquiring of the family, right, of an insider who was closer to the president, and in the other case, she's representing the president to the outside world, and the president would have to say, um, humble me rather than honored me. So for a moment, she, as the president's spokesperson, she has to take the president's um, social viewpoint <laughs> and um, use honorifics in the right kind of way. OK, um, so here's some blending structures, some really simple blending structures that um, talk about this stuff. So this is, can I come to your party? So this is just assuming that I have a, a speaker hearer space um, where there's some kind of frame involving roles of speaker and addressee. Okay. Um, and there's also a deictic coordinate space that involves um, physical viewpoint that's centered at one particular center of perception. Okay? And when I say, can I come to your party, the speaker remains over here, but the deictic coordinate space is um, plunked down for, for purposes of come. The deictic coordinate space is plunked down on top of the speaker. Okay? Um, but since there's a speaker here structure, that determines what I and you are going to be like, how I'm going to use them. The rules are going to be a little different for other languages. It's not the case in every language that go and come get um, moved around exactly the way they do in English. OK, now here's please come to my party. And in, it, in this case, the deictic um, center is plugged down right on top of I, and there isn't anything um, complex to look at. But the point that we're seeing here is that um, even for very everyday English data, we have to be able to pull apart aspects of viewpoint, right? I'm the speaker, let's say, and a relationship between a speaker and a hearer from an imagined deictic center and a viewpoint. Sometimes it has to be the hearer's viewpoint that is the, is the deictic center. OK. Um, temporal deixis, we were just mentioning. Um, it's no surprise that since um, time is all about relationship to and imagine present, um, tense is all about, that we get lots of um, go futures in particular. Um, so here we have a diagram of the kind of blend involved in a go future. There's a very bad little um, icon of an eye up there looking forwards um, towards the profile time. Um, <laughs> and there's a um, deictic viewpoint center of some kind. So there's a subjective experience center, something like that, and a um, a deictic viewpoint center, which are co-located and are both considering a profile time in the future. All right, um, but you also get things like um, I'm coming to appreciate John's sense of humor. And when you say I'm coming to appreciate John's sense of humor, you mean like I don't really appreciate it yet. So we are talking about a possibly still in the future event, right? The the full appreciation of John's sense of humor. Um, might yet be future relative to us. Um, but we've moved the viewpoint to that future um, profile time. And we're looking at it as if you know, our appreciation is gradually approaching uh, our viewpoint. And it was Michelle Emanation, whose work um, on Bantu tense systems unearthed um, languages that have both come and go futures and required this kind of displaced analysis. But come futures are way less common in the world's languages than go futures. And I think you can sort of see why. Because um, this displacement of um, deictic viewpoint from the present is unusual. It's atypical, more complex as a, as a viewpoint phenomenon. OK. Um, so now I'm going to show you some uh, gestures in a moment <laughs> that go with this. But um, this is a diagram of an imagined uh, experiential basis for some of the spatiotemporal blends that we um, have. So as I walk along a path, I know that if I keep on walking, I'm going to be at the next place ahead of me in, in the at the next moment in the future, at the next place ahead of that, at the future moment beyond that, and so on. And also that I was a moment ago at the place just behind me, then at the place before that, at the place behind that, and so on. 
Okay, so places I was in the past are behind me. Places I'm going to be in the future as I'm moving along the path are in front of me. Um, and there's two separate things that could be said about visual experience and its correlation with this. One is that the places that are behind me on the trail, imagine me hiking in the Sierras or something and going around corners and so on, um, I have seen the places that I have been on the trail. And I have not yet seen the places that are ahead of me on the trail around the next curve and so on. Okay? Um, so that corresponds to the idea that I've got like a dark area here and a light area here. But of course I also have an area that's within my current visual horizon, right? And that's divided in half more or less. That is to say, um, I can't see whatever is immediately behind me. And I can see the part of the visual horizon space in, that's in front of me. Okay. And we will see that these um, matter for, for uh, these different metaphors. But the crucial thing for English and for most of the world's languages is that the seen part of the path is um, known and behind you um, and the unseen part of the path is unknown and in front of you and future in time if you keep on moving in the same direction. Okay, so we say things like I'm going to do it, um, where going to some place in the future means um, doing the thing in the future. Okay, so um, gesture as well as language shows deictic centers, displacement phenomena, blended deictic structure, all kinds of cool things. Um, so just to give you like one of my l smallest examples here, I can say to you, well, you know, in my Berkeley office, the light switch is right here. Okay? Now, I don't even know how I am oriented with respect to how, the, my unusual orientation in entering my Berkeley office. I am facing west when I normally enter my Berkeley office. I know that. But I don't know how I'm oriented right this moment. Um, but you would know if you ever got to the door of my Berkeley office. You would know where my light switch was. And you wouldn't assume that it's in the location of this chair or in phase location or anything like that. Right? Because you know that this is a deferred point in another space. Right? I'm saying, OK. Imagine yourself at the door of my Berkeley office, wherever that is, um, settle yourself there, and then follow this point. Okay, so pointing is quite complex, um, and it necessarily involves a deictic structure because our bodies involve a, a, a consciousness of being present in some particular place, um, crucial back front asymmetry in access, in visual access, in um, manual access and all these kinds of things. Um, we won't right now talk about the um, up-down asymmetry. It's there too, of course, and it, it, it actually fits into the deictic system as well. Um, but this very crucial um, front-back asymmetry and this uh, spread out of viewpoint and this, these limited fields. So actually I have um, neural systems in my body whose job it is to figure out whether things are in my personal space or not. And it's a very, very clever neural system because it turns on um, when the thing is farther away if it's approaching me faster. So it, it says, oh, it's in your personal space um, at a bigger distance if, the, if I've got a, let's say, a, a softball whizzing towards me than if I have uh, somebody sauntering up towards me. Um, and it also um, adapts to reach. So you give a, um, an ape a reaching stick of some kind or other that will enable him to reach um, food that he couldn't otherwise reach. And it becomes um, part of the um, personal space that lights up neurally here. So it's a very adaptable thing. But I do have this special um, neural system that tells me whether something is uh, part of my personal space. So I have here a beginning, right, a center and a neural system that's specifically devoted to that. Um, to telling me, is it close to me? Is it far from me? Is it reachable? Is it non-reachable? Um, and we could say that's the beginning of a, a deictic system. And obviously, in gesture, I actually am using my real reaching hand, right? I am an embodied, deictic, deictically structured human being. So I import a deictic center with me wherever I go. And gesture has this. Um, so gesture is a power, you could say, a p very powerful icon for um, 
representing Dijkstra's because you represent Dijkstra's by using actual Dijkstra's. Right? There's there's the light switch. Um, okay. Um, right. Yes, I don't think we'll actually do all of the, um, we did some of it. Okay, so here is an English language, um, let me see if I can manage to get him to start. There we go. I'm a little dyslexic, I read this three times. Maybe right. it's me. It's the Wycliffe Country Place Skilled Nursing and Rehabilitation Home. Explain their slogan. Helping residents today remember tomorrow's yesterday. <laughs> Now, wouldn't that be today? Isn't now, what is tomorrow's yesterday? yesterday? Today. <laughs> okay. What does that mean? Tomorrow's yesterday? Today. <laughs> okay. So that's an English speaker who's pointing in front of him for um, tomorrow, right? Um, and let's say right in front of him for today, um, in the space immediately in front of him for today, and would point backwards for uh, the past. All right, now, um, there's, you'll find all over the um, linguistic literature, you will find claims that there are languages where the future is behind and uh, the past is in front. But um, you can, if you haven't already, um, I don't want to bore you if you have, read um, Rafael Nunez's in my article. Um, there's been, not, when the literature is surveyed, you find that actually most of those cases are mistaken understandings of linguistic usages that talk about earlier events as in front of later events and later events as behind earlier events. And if those later events are also future, they may be behind earlier events and also be future. But um, Aymara and per probably a bunch of um, Andean and Highlands languages around it because we have scattered data from other researchers who've been um, around the Andes. Uh, but we don't have full linguistic data on any of the other these languages, um, does have a system where the past is in front of ego, okay, and the future is behind ego. And it's a static system. Instead of being based on, oh my gosh, um, I've seen all the places behind me on the trail and I, um, I um, haven't yet seen the places, that the future places on the trail uh, that are ahead of me, it's based on an understanding that, okay, here I am, I'm standing right here, I can see what's in front of me, I can't see what's behind me. And the past is known, and the future is unknown. All right, so unknown is invisible, unseen, and known is visible, seen, and that's all there is to it. Now, this really lacks a lot of inferences we'd sort of like to have, or we English speakers um, think we'd like to have from um, spatiotemporal metaphor systems. That is to say, here I am standing here, okay, um, can I, the fact that that wall is in front of me, does that tell you anything about whether I am going to be co-present with that wall in the future? No, right? If I were moving, you could make inferences about, yes, yeah, she's moving towards that wall, she's gonna um, eventually get there. But if I'm just standing here, the fact that I'm looking at, facing in a particular direction does not tell you anything about whether I'm gonna be co-present with it. So you can't draw the kinds of inferences about future events or events that are gonna become present that you could easily draw from a um, dynamic system. But this is the Aymara spatial system, and I'm gonna um, give you an example. So this guy is gonna use the phrase, I'm gonna give you first the video, then I'm gonna give you with a um, transcript beside it, and then I'm gonna give you a video again. Um, this guy is gonna um, be asked what Naira Mara means, and Naira Mara is a, um, an Aymara phrase, meaning literally um, face or eye year, and that means front time, okay? Um, face and eye are the words for front in lots of situations in Aymara. Um, and it means past times, old times, long ago times, okay? So let's see if we can. Ooh. Como se dice él? Ah, Naira Mara. Naira Mara. What's the center guy's hand? Naira Mara quiere decir tiempo antiguo. Claro. ¿Qué quiere decir? Naira Mara, ¿qué quiere decir? 
que del tiempo antes. Pues. Ah, ya, ya, ya. Pero don Aurelio... Ok, so it means um, old times, past times, um, and he gestures, first of all, forwards with um, one hand, and then forwards, switching the musical instrument out of his hand, he gestures forwards with the other hand to say um, old times here. So um, there, he's being interrogated in Spanish, so como se dice, a ver, uh, how do you say it? Um, quiere decir, what does it mean? Um, Naira mara, que quiere decir? All right. <coughs> ¿Cómo se dice él? Ah, Naira Mara. Naira Mara. Uh -huh. eh, Naira Mara quiere decir tiempo antiguo. Claro. Uh -huh. ah, ¿qué, quiere, ¿Qué quiere decir? ¿Ah? Naira Mara, ¿qué quiere decir? Quiere el tiempo antes. Pues. Ah, ya, ya. Rafael's determined to get another gesture out of him. <laughs> ok. Um, so we w I won't talk here about um, the ways in which we talked about spatial blends, and we said I keep and keep I and you fixed and move um, the center for come and go to you rather than me. Um, similar things happen with temporal stuff, so you can say things like the so-called historical present can say things like um, so this guy comes up to me and then he says, um, or now the basic mechanisms of British parliamentary government were in place. Um, <laughs> so you can. Uh, the didactic center and the self-location viewpoint, so to speak, are separable in time as well as in space. And textual dixis, so um, very frequently in lots of languages, things like this and that mean um, the one that I'm about to talk about versus the one I just talked about. So the, these are didactic um, to the text. Um, and this is pervasive in lots and lots of languages, but there's differences in the patterns of mapping. Um, okay. Um, so how does this all start? What, what, what would make this all be the case? Well, babies start life with a perceptual system that gives them constant correlation between a bunch of different aspects of their experience. And you can't get rid of this correlation. It's just there all the time. So what is their location of conscious self-awareness? Where are they aware of being, right? Um, the locations of physically surrounding objects and people, barriers and so on. Um, their manual grasp range, so their manual grasp range correlates with where they are, right? Um, their visual phys a perception of um, and access to these objects, their social interaction and encounter structures, how do you approach people to get their notice and so on. Um, and People who've talked about experiential correlations to talk about metaphor, for example, have said, oh yes, you know, in many, many circumstances that are important, um, the height of a liquid in a container is a good, valid, highly valid cue for the quantity of liquid in the container, right? But height isn't about quantity all the time, right? If I were to uh, pour tons of, of water on my lawn, it wouldn't rise higher very fast. Um, this doesn't work that way. These are correlated all the time. They're distinct things, but they're constantly correlated and you never get rid of it. Um, and normal visual development entails um, managing to connect up your visual system with your um, motor system, with your um, planning system for motor things, with your imaging, not just of what something might um, lo look like, but what it would feel like if you touched it. Um, what its manipulative affordances are, how you would move your hand around it, um, and of course what it would look like if I looked at the other side of it. So I firmly believe that every single one of the chairs you're sitting on has a back, even though I can't see any of them, because my visual system developed normally. Um, okay, and so this is, as I was saying, way um, more salient and omnipresent than other primary scenes that have been talked about in the linguistics literature. And you certainly would want to say that the blend is in some sense simpler than its components. So it's more complicated to make a broken up dictic viewpoint where I have I and you and I've moved come over to you, for example. And it's simpler to say, OK, I've got one primary center and all the perception is mostly being done from that um, viewpoint. But babies are also born with, of course, mirror neural cir circuits, which mean that some, not all, of the mirror neurons, uh, w of, the, of the neurons which fire when I do hand motion, mouth motion, foot motion, um, also fire when I see someone else doing the relevant hand motions, foot motions, mouth motions, and so on. Um, 
Not all, because if all of them fired, I'd be hallucinating and thinking it was me that was performing the motion. But um, some of these do um, co-fire co, uh, for other people as well as for us. So we're busy ex associating actions experienced from inside with similar actions experienced from the outside, which we partially experience as if they were from the inside, maybe. Um, so we're busy from early babyhood categorizing actions across some kind of boundary between a participant viewpoint and an external viewpoint, managing to think of um, drinking the milk as the same when someone else does it as when we do, but not, of course, confusing our doing it with somebody else doing it, which is quite a different experience. Um, and we keep track of our neighbor's affordances. So I know at any given time, being a city dweller, I know at any given time who can reach into my backpack and who can't. Um, <laughs> OK. Um, and um, this extends into um, further aspects of the gesture system. So what I'm about to show you is um, an example of a really common phenomenon, which is um, gesturing to talk about the performance of a, an action. And you would always gesture in talking about doing something if it wasn't actually physically moving towards you. So he came up to me, OK, maybe. But um, this way or this way, OK? So he went to graduate school and gradually finished his degree. Not he went to graduate school and gradually finished his degree, right? So these directions are the two. And OK, they'd be switched for a lefty, right? So dominant hand um, would be the primary mover. But why is that? Well, it's because actual physical motion, actual physical actions often involve moving outwards from the body to go do something, grasp something, whatever, presumably, right? So there's a deictic structure here where somehow the start of the process I'm talking about is located near me in my body as I gesture about it, and the end of the process is further away from me. So he's going to be talking about. Um, Making a, a dialing a, a iPhone. That, um, the interesting thing to think about for analyzing the brain is just how we have to do everyday spatial motor um, tasks. And the key feature of spatial motor tasks is the bookkeeping you need to keep track of where you are. You dial a phone number, 38537. You have to about? know when you're doing the three, you have to know where you are. Is it the first three or the second three? Right? <laughs> and what we've shown and suggested is that what happens. Okay. So this is the um, transcript here, right? Um, you, di you dial a phone number, 38537, um, and you have to know what, when you're doing the three, you have to know where you are. Is it the first three or the second three? OK, so one more time, just because you can't watch it that, video once. Um, the interesting thing to think about for analyzing the brain is just how we have to do everyday spatial motor um, tasks. And the key feature of spatial motor tasks is the bookkeeping you need to keep track of where you are. You dial a phone number, 38537. You have to know, when you're doing the three, you have to know where you are. Is it the first three or the second three? Right? And what we've shown and suggested is that. OK. All right. Um, so yes. So the crucial thing here is that dialing a phone number, let's say I'm dialing a phone number. My arm is not moving closer to me or farther away from me. There is no deictic motion towards me or away from me involved in dialing a phone number. But in understanding what it is to be doing a process, I didactically locate the beginning of the process. Metaphorically, didactically locate the beginning of the process um, near me and the end of the process away from me. So all of a sudden, dyxis is hanging around in areas that we didn't have any idea it was hanging around in. OK. Um, linguistic constructions that talk about different viewpoints on events. So um, in lots of languages, it's very common to have a, a verb that um, re relates to the particular kind of action. So think of the baby doing drinking. Um, there's a verb drink, and it means drink whether you're doing it, whether I'm doing it, whoever's doing it, whatever my viewpoint is. Um, but different morphology depending on the performer of the action, person, and number. Um, lots of languages have middle and reflexive forms that differentiate um, self-directed action from other directed action. So it is really different to um, comb somebody else's hair versus combing your hair. Right, it's a different set of motor routines and everything. Um, but you know, we still might have a verb comb and have 
different um, forms of the verb to, to talk about that kind of thing. Active and passive forms, we might say, um, characterize agent viewpoint and patient viewpoint on the same action. So we could say that these are all uh, perspectival as well. OK. Um, let's go on. OK. So how do we develop all this? And what does this have to do with theory of mind? Because that's an important uh, aspect of viewpoint, certainly. Um, so everybody seems to want to mean by theory of mind whatever stage of it they think is the most important stage, which is um, it's not that the data are so um, disagreed on. It's like what counts as theory of mind, which stage in people's uh, data counts as theory of mind. But anyway, um, from the very beginning of their lives, babies react differently to humans and animates than to non-human and inanimate things. They are focused on, on faces. They, uh, even though they don't have much understanding of what it means to be human or animate of the kind that we have as adults. Um, they share attention loci. They attend to eye gaze direction and so on. Um, and long before children have what is officially called theory of mind, what, wh how can children have such really quite um, versatile strategies for um, knowing what adults are likely to keep them from doing and managing to find ways to get to do it despite adult interference, right? This is not theory of mind in the sense that they don't pass a theory of the theory of mind tests or something yet, but um, surely there's something there at that point. Okay. Now, at a late stage, we get um, what I'd like to, what usually is called theory of mind, which is something like a meta awareness, an ability to talk about the fact and reason overtly about the fact that other people's minds not, not only have minds and intentions, but minds and intentions and states that are different from the state of my mind, okay, and be able to articulate that. But that's not all there is to um, having viewpoint, right? <laughs> Children are viewpointed from much earlier. And Putting yourself in somebody else's position cognitively and emotionally is something that, we, of course, having these very partial um, overlap between neural systems, we never fully learn and we can never fully get out of. We kind of can't help um, empathy and um, getting involved in viewpoint. And of course, we never fully do that either. But this ability to maintain some kind of local coherence between differing viewpoints. You know that your parent is about to grab you and try to put you in bed, um, and you evade, right? You, and you're quite aware of it. Or you think of an excuse. You say, oh, one more story, Daddy, right? Um, a glass of water. <laughs> OK. Um, so this kind of local coherence between differing viewpoints, physical viewpoints and cognitive viewpoints, is, I think, a plausible basis on which to build on later higher level awareness of different viewpoints as separate and distinct parts of a coherent scene. OK. So that's a start on that anyway. Now, adult cog cognition and viewpoint requires a whole, a whole lot of stuff, a lot of different things. So of course it requires that we have the experiential correlations that I talked about. Right, that we live daily with the fact that a certain part of our visual range is also our manual reach range, and so on and so on. Okay? And that that's in front of us, not in back of us. And that I have to turn around to get manual reach and visual range behind me and all that. Okay. Um, we project that kind of um, cor experiential correlation of viewpoint onto other people, too, so we know what other people can see or can't see. Um, I must say that in the um, interaction with the deaf community, you get a really new idea of how sensitive you need to be to what people can see or can't see, because of course, um, you need the hands to be visible <laughs> to everybody. Um, so yes, we do know what people can see and can't see, but we aren't noticing everything the same that they're noticing. Um, to meta-navigate this system, so go back and forth between representing which viewpoints and know when our language forces us to use come rather than go and move our didactic center. While we have um, less global and le um, more global and less viewpointed spatial representations as well as um, very specific ones, um, and can re represent things linguistically both ways, um, project all of this onto um, less concrete domains like time, social relations, neighborhoods that aren't our kind of neighborhoods, um, cognitive structure, and um, abstract selfhood. 
and maintain more and less perspectival models of those two, and be able to take apart viewpoint blends and remix them, so maintaining, as I was saying, inus and unus separate from a proximal distal structure to re to reblend them another way. I already talked about participant versus global, um, and here this is the last um, set of videos, and I think actually I'll go on and do the next one. Yeah, okay, so here, all right. So what this is an example of is the way in which um, American English speakers, when they interact with each other, um, they have, separate from personal space, but it's related to it, um, something which you might call personal gesture space. Okay, and it's normal for American English speakers to, um, and, and this kind of distance thing varies with culture, to sit down, let's say, at a table like these guys have with some distance between their two gesture spaces, but not too much. It would be very strange for two people to just seat themselves at opposite ends of a table for no reason. That would feel pretty socially distant. But also, it would be weird unless you were crowded around the table by the fact that there were too many people, it'd be weird to like cuddle up really close to somebody too, right? Okay, so there's a natural distance, and as you will see, there's a gestural line between them, okay? So when somebody wants to claim the floor, and this is a, a piece from a paper that um, Marissa Sizemore and I um, wrote that has been, ta been taking forever to come out. We presented it in 04, and I hope it'll be out this year. Um, but what we sh showed was that the only times that um, the speakers in our sample actually crossed into the inter space or into the other person's gesture space, which they did sometimes, um, was when they wanted to regulate the conversation, start a new topic, um, demand the floor, um, whatever. And so here's one example of a um, new topic and floor claiming right, um, example. And I'll give you a transcript right after. Okay, hey, tell me the things you're, you're okay. hyper <laughs> All right, so what she's saying is, okay, tell me the things you're hyperanal about. This is fun. And as she starts this, um, she reaches forward into the other person's space, um, establishes the new topic, and shows her sharing and solidarity also, I think, by, uh, by reaching forward. And then she sits back to show she's not um, claiming the floor anymore and waits to listen to the story. All right. Um, so one more. I have to show this, and then I will wrap up. <laughs> okay, tell me the things you're, you're okay. hyperanal about. This is fun. <laughs> okay. And you don't notice these things at all. People do them all the time. They um, hit the table. They reach into the other person's face and so on. That's normal interaction. Now you'll notice them. Okay? You'll see them all the time. And they are on this line between the two, um, the two sp speakers, whatever the um, closest line is. Along that line is the, is the one that you um, reach gesturally. All right, I will not do um, roll blends, too bad. <laughs> okay, but um, sign language has the same kinds of um, structures that we've been talking about in gesture, and I'll recommend you all to the uh, work of Paul Dudas um, for more information about that, but you can do um, deferred spatial structures in sign language. You can do um, participant viewpoint, you can do global viewpoint, all the things that, I give you one sign example anyway. All right, um, so to finish up at last, um, viewpoint and subjectivity are inextricably involved in most of the mental structures that language expresses, that we can communicate with. Um, and so almost every kind of mental representation involves effects of blending on viewpoint and perspective. So sometimes it's really easy to align two perspectives in that case, there may be very little creative work involved. Plunk down the deictic center on the eye, and I've got it. Um, but if you've got multiple perspectives, mutually contradictory, that's when you get these really fancy and interesting blends, and that's when you can do things like uh, the light switches right here. Okay. Um, and that is, well, it says it's, uh, wh why should we talk about signed languages? All right, I'll give one second to that. <laughs> um, Okay, so gesture and signed languages are really important data, um, not because we don't have viewpoint in spoken languages. We do, of course. We have perspective and viewpoint and so on, and we haven't noticed all the ways that we have it. Um, but because they 
give us a cline along which to look at the ways in which all these very high level, what on earth does it mean to say on um, this to mean the one I'm about to talk about in the book that's further down the page, right? And that to mean the one that's further up the page, right? That doesn't really give me a lot of direct um, content, but our gesture and sign language, which use space to represent dixis, um, give us an idea of sort of where the roots of these systems are in a physical deictic system. And I'll stop there. Well, I'm going to here invoke what um, some of you may know about this, uh, what Dan Slobin calls uh, thinking for speaking. Um, <laughs> so this is sort of a modified Worfian hypothesis. Uh, Worf sort of believed that our, um, all of our perception, our cognition, everything was in, to more or less degree, and, which, and the Worfians were maybe more rigid about this than Worf, warped by the linguistic distinctions we're making. Um, and what Dan Slobin's been showing is that, well, maybe that's not always true, that we don't have access to the same perceptions, but we don't have immediate rote access in the same way to perceptions. So for example, um, I, in um, attempting to use a new language, let's say um, Hebrew, which demands um, masculine and feminine in the second person, where I'm not used to doing it, Right? might have real difficulty producing those forms, even though I have no trouble with the concepts of second person and um, masculine feminine right, for pronouns, but that's still tough. And I've noticed that Chinese speakers learning English who don't have to use gender in their pronouns at all, they don't have any problem. Like, they could tell you the English pronoun rule. They know how to apply it to male versus female human beings. That's not the issue. It's just that it's not there in their rote processing in the same kind of way. Um, so that's the sort of difference that you'd expect to find. Um, linguistically is sort of more focus on more immediate rote access to certain categories than to, than to others, but not necessarily the inability to understand the things that are less. Mm -hmm. Which of you is first? Okay, <laughs> you first and then you. <laughs> I'm looking at a 19th century French treatise on gestures, cool. rules for gestures and painting and drawing. Do you happen to know, when, are there earlier ones? Do they appear in the Renaissance? You know, the person to ask about that is Adam Kendon, who um, edited the uh, Andrea Di Iorio um, book, and who also, in his the first chapter of his um, book, uh, Gesture, the visible, a visible action as utterance. There we are, yeah. Um, <laughs> Kendon, K-E-N-D-O-N, and um, gesture is the beginning. You don't need to like remember the whole title. Um, but the beginning of it does give a, a sort of a history of gesture studies. And there are like fabulous like Roman Plautus manuscripts, things like this, that um, have illustrations showing the supposed gestures of the characters in the plays and so on. Um, fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so Early on, you talked about come and go, for an example. So I got a question that basically comes and goes in it, I guess, which is when you were started talking about babies, I thought a place you were going to go was how babies learn dyxis, uh, which could be under or, or, or uh, gotten at by mistakes they make as they start learning language and uses of words that they then eliminate. Uh, so, you know, for example, how does it, how does the baby, how does a human being come to know the difference between come and go, uh, or other dyxis issues? Has that been, you didn't talk about that at all. Is That's that right. Part? And I, I glossed over, actually, Catherine Young's radical claim that actually we, um, what we need to learn to do, she says, is to distinguish our bodies, to differentiate our bodies from other ones, not to um, 
inhabit other bodies, but to disinhabit them, so to speak. Um, I don't think that's true. I think we have a constant awareness of what is our own bodily sensation as well. But I think that's a corrective to the idea that we're somehow like experiencing things constantly only from one rigid point of view. But it is difficult to negotiate these things. And um, there's a lot of work on children's acquisition of pronouns. Because that's not easy, right? It's easy for the kid to know that, let's say, the kid's name is Sam, right? That Sam refers to this particular person, um, and that mommy refers to that particular person, and daddy refers to that particular person. But I and you are harder. They really are, and come and go also. That's right. You have to be able to know that not only does somebody else have like maybe a different manual access, different whatever, right, but also has a different linguistic system for talking about it. And that comes later. That only comes with, with a little more meta-awareness. Um, I mean, you, you presented some things here, I guess you presented them sort of as, as statements, but also there's hypotheses in there going on. Has there been any exploration of these hypotheses or the, 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 the construct dixis by looking at how language develops in, in human beings? Well, as I say, we know that kids make mistakes with come and go and I, and I and you, but we don't know much more beyond that at this stage. That's right. We know those are hard relative to... Um, proper names, let's say, but not much more. That's right. So there's plenty of space for. <laughs> plenty of places to go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you noticed any correlation between, I guess, when two participants in a discussion don't exactly have the, uh, the viewpoint settled and they're still trying to negotiate a common viewpoint, is there any correlation between that negotiation and like a speech gesture mentioned. Well, actually, this is something that I am interested in. Um, and the, the work of my grad student, Shweta Narayan, right now, um, is really interesting here. She's got a, a fabulous example. One of the things that she's been doing experimentally is um, showing people, as, uh, um, subjects, pictures. So let's say you can see a picture, OK? And I can't see it. And you have to describe it to me well enough so that I'll be able to pick it from among a set of pictures afterwards, right? So I'll be able to figure it out. Um, and there is an example. She's got, it's a um, frame from a comic strip where the person looking at the picture doesn't get it. They can't figure out what's happening. And gradually, as they continue to describe the situation, the person who can't see the picture figures out what happens, OK? And watching the um, ways in which the person who cannot see the picture is trying to follow the viewpoint gesturally of the person describing the picture until the moment when she thinks, oh my gosh, I get what's going on. And all of a sudden, she switches the viewpoint entirely from her point of view, right? It's as if she's looking at the picture. Um, so yes, it, it does seem as if uh, negotiation about these kinds of spatial things anyway. Now, Boy, I, I would love to know more about the more abstract things. That is indeed part of the uh, future project, would be like looking at more about um, gesture in, and discourse structure and interaction. Yeah. Um, the Dyke plans you have analyzed all have the extremely convenient feature of taking uh, the complex of Dyke possibilities and compressing them to something simpler and more, than human, more human scale. So if I'm on the phone in case and I'm calling you at Berkeley and I say, as I have said, will you come to my party? And if we're doing Skype, you can see the, <laughs> now, the party's at my house and I'm here and you're in Berkeley. So we have these to negotiate. But in the blend, and we're not deluded. Right. In the blend, I, you know, me and my house are now one because we've collapsed. The now, I'd like to give you a second an example. And actually, it was really interesting at Vera's Orals to see um, points going on towards the screen where my image was, which were not towards me because they weren't opposite each other, right? So I, I, I had a screen that was f focused on Vera, as you recall, right? So people would be pointing at me, but they wouldn't be pointing towards the screen, towards my screen. They'd be pointing towards right. that other one. And that was, that was a very strange, uncompressed 
viewpoint. Yeah. And, and, and uh, surprising, therefore, because where you have the camera and the screen in these video conferences in different spots, that's not the way it is uh, in our usual space. And so there's technology to fix that. But I want to give you one example of what looks is a, a kind of case that you haven't analyzed, um, but it has the same phenomenon. And the suggestion of how I do it here if you do it differently. So this is a case where uh, there's a standard blending template where you have analogy and disanalogy between two different things, often that are in di two different spots. And in the blend, they become one thing, and the analogies are identity, and the di disanalogies are changed. This is like old mental space, my tax bill gets bigger every year. It's this one, it's Dykedy. Um, in, 19, in 1997, Sally Boyson, a primatologist, and I were in UC San Diego to both of giving a talk. And at one point she said, so you know how it is. You buy the new house, and you go into the bathroom, and the light switch isn't there anymore. Right? Notice the anymore. <laughs> now, we're not deluded. We don't think her new bathroom and her old bathroom are the same, and that any light switches have disappeared or anything like that. But what has happened is that the two different possible didactic spots are now in the blend collapsed into one. And what would have to be a disanalogy between two different spots becomes change. a change yeah. in the one didactic spot, which gets us back to a more human scale. Right. Case. That's how I am. I think that sounds right. Okay. That sounds very right. Do you have some other examples? I mean, do you have any complexities in that to add? Boy, I have, I have to go back and think about, you know, I, I, I did write about the, uh, <laughs> right, that her apartment, her apartment gets bigger every year or whatever. Um, but I'll have to re reconsider those, uh, those blends um, as, as part of this as well. I think part of what has, has made it so slow to get at some of these basic ones is that once you see them, they're totally obvious, right? It would be very weird if, let's say, addressing you I, um, or claiming the floor from you, I reached out over here yeah. rather than over here yeah. to claim the floor, right? Um, but yeah. the fact that there's this line between us um, and that that has to do with what our two didactic um, self structures are like. Reaching out over there means Mark, why don't you give somebody else a chance? <laughs> <laughs> One more question, if there is one. I'm so curious about what there are structures that <clears throat> negotiate between in the more complex view viewpoint sets. So I guess one thought I was having is, do you give away who you really side with when you say something like, Sheila came to understand John's point of view, as opposed to Sheila went to under or moved to understanding uh, John's point of view? Okay, now this is really t even more complex because even understand, right, presupposes that um, there's something right about the understanding that she's reaching, right, understand and know. But let's say Sheila came to believe that such and such doesn't seem to have quite as much complex viewpoint structure, right, when I take away the, um, the verb that demands that you identify um, the thing that she believed with my own beliefs. Um, the come seems to stay right there, so to speak. The didactic center is now with, with the um, viewpoint that she's arriving at. It's not my viewpoint. So she came to believe that this was the case. That doesn't tell you whether I believe it or not. So I think understand was the interference yeah, I guess there. I mean, are there things like, are they group viewpoints? And, I mean, things that, are, that, encompass, that, that encompass more than just the two. I mean, they're now oh, things. Yeah, and I haven't even talked about, I mean, like you could add to the list of viewpoint stuff um, all the words that have particular frames, right? So um, Chuck Fillmore's old, old example, right? The trial where um, one side of the trial insisted on referring to the fetus and the other side to the baby, um, right? Um, well, that's the frame that you've got, and as um, George Lakoff has been pointing out, if you once start fighting about whether or not tax relief is a good idea, you've already um, given in, right? If you're calling it tax relief, relief is relief from something painful and oppressive. Um, so, right, find another word, <laughs> because you've, you have already participated in the viewpoint, um, and at that point, you're, 
not effectively fighting for the other viewpoint anymore. So yeah, the, uh, anything that involves um, presuppositional structure framing, uh, whatever, also is part of this. And that's why I was saying so, so much of what we say reveals what our particular viewpoint of the world is. And the list of things that you get in textbooks of linguistic viewpoint phenomena is just nothing compared to the number of ways that you can give yourself away. Thank you.